Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still on site at Indie Bios demo day number eight. We are now talking with Paul Schmitzberger. Hello. Thank you Thanks so for having me. On. Yeah. Super excited awesome. for this. <laughs> CEO of Blue Planet Ecosystems. That's right, that's right. And you just gave the talk on the main stage. What were you pitching? Well, how you turn sunlight into seafood. That's what our company is doing. And unpack this more for us. Sunlight into seafood. Yeah, sure. So basically what we do is we replicate an aquatic ecosystem, right? So we start by producing uh, microalgae in tubular photobioreactors. This microalgae is fed to zooplankton. What we displayed out there was a, a species called Daphnia, which is in turn a natural food for fish and, and for shrimp. Okay, and so let's start breaking this down piece by piece. So you said the first one was uh, microalgae. Exactly, yeah. Okay, and yeah, so teach us about how do you source microalgae where, and you're growing that just in water in the first chamber? Exactly, so basically okay. microalgae um, supply about 50% of the world's oxygen, right? Um, it's uh, quite a fascinating organism um, that is the foundation of almost any food chain in, in, that you find in the world, or at least in, in, in water. And they are really, really good in transforming sunlight into biomass. They're really good, uh, if the conditions are right, they take in CO2, break it apart, break water apart, and recombine it to beautiful molecules that you know as you know, fatty acids and proteins and, and all, of that, all of that stuff. This is what they are evolved for. And if you put them in the right conditions, their population just explodes. Whoa. And um, because the phytoplankton also mm -hmm. are a massive contributor to uh, the oxygenation of, of the world. True. So okay. if, if I'm saying uh, microalgae, it's also phytoplankton, right? Oh, so so it's phytoplankton uh, included in? Exactly. Oh, microalgae. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. Okay. So, uh, botanists argue what is micro <laughs> if, if, if they're even uh, <laughs> plants, it's... Uh, we are using this pretty unscientific and mean both, actually. Okay, yeah. okay. And so then, um, okay, under the right conditions, so what are the conditions for the microalgae? So, uh, for the most part, it's light as energy source, obviously, but it's also uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, stuff that we actually want okay. to get rid of, yeah. um, but also uh, other compounds like nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, iron, stuff like this, but in fairly low quantities actually. Okay, and then are you, and so then you have to, you have to sit, you're using LED lights then, is that? Uh, no, we what are. What are you using? Yeah. So we are using sunlight. Um, How do you, sunlight? How do we sunlight? How do you so sunlight? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my background is as a renewable energy engineer, right? So okay. uh, if you're working in photovoltaics, for example, a lot of time and effort is put into place how to align these photovoltaic panels correctly so that the maximum amount of sun is transformed into yes. kilowatt hours of electricity. Now we tweak these uh, tools and, and mechanisms so we optimize it for this biological process which basically means breaking up the surface um, into many many different tubes increasing the surface where uh, sunlight can interact with the algae population and by th therefore optimizing the entire, the entire system. And then you make, how do you make the sunlight then? Just put our container so that everything is... Interesting, you put it outdoors. Yeah, yeah. It's everything that we do is optimized for the outdoors. Because sunlight is basically free. Yes. Right? Electricity is okay, not. Okay, so the microalgae is living in this top container yeah. with sunlight that it's okay. Exactly. So you have to add the microalgae for when it's not in obviously like the ocean when you have yeah. your own. Okay, okay. And then, because um, let's, we're looking at this container, you know, we have the video embedded mm -hmm. here that we took earlier. And that, so then. So then um, you add microalgae, then you add, um, then you have it sitting in sunlight, and then that's happening in the first chamber is, what is the process happening in the first chamber? How does it feed into the second chamber? How does it make, yeah, fish? Yeah, yeah true. Fish. So I mean, if, if uh, your viewers get the video as well, I think it's yes. easier to imagine. So at the top, which is exposed to sunlight, we grow these, these microalgae in these tubular structures. Um, and then we feed it to the second unit uh, of the system. Um, and the second unit is basically a large body of water 
where we keep zooplankton. Um, okay. In our case, what you see on the video, it's a species called Daphnia, which uh, basically filter feeds on these algae. And um, if they have the same population characteristics of, of algae, more or less, right? So if the conditions are right, their population just completely explodes. Something that we basically exploit, right? So we're trying to create the conditions that are ideal for these organisms. And yes. when they are, the number just increases exponentially. And that's for the, the exponential increase happens with the microalgae in the first one. Exactly. And then it happens with the zooplankton okay. in the second one. Okay. And, you know, if you have exponential functions in nature, this can't go on forever. Mm. So what happens in nature is basically that you have a bloom of algae or an outbreak of zooplankton. And they take up all the, the, the resources and then the population just crashes. This is what happens in an algae bloom or... Um, if you watch the newspaper frequently, typically in the warm summer months, this, this happens. Now, we use um, computer vision and machine learning to basically catch these trends, right? So we are able to convert these trends into actual data and feed it into predictive models uh, to tell us when the ideal time for harvesting the zooplankton uh, actually comes around. And... Um, we don't just harvest the zooplankton, we actually switch on a pump which basically dumps the, the Daphnia into the fish tank, which is just another large body of water where these fish naturally feed on, on these zooplankton. Whoa, okay, okay, so got it. Microalgae, the zooplankton, and the zooplankton are fed to the fish. Exactly. So then do you have to start with fish population yourself and then, okay. Yes, so this is what you actually have to introduce, at least every harvest once. Um, oh, so you introduce, okay. let's say, 100 grams of, of larvae of, of shrimp, for example, okay. right? Tiny, tiny things. Okay. But because they are fed and treated, right? Um, their body mass just grows really, really fast, right? So out of two or 100 grams, 200 gram, grams of larvae, you get um, 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds of no actual way. fish. No way. Yeah, 1,000, 2,000 pounds of shrimp from 100 grams of larva. Yeah, let's yeah. Make, make it 200, 200 right? It's just, a very, yeah. it's just a very tiny... Damn. That's what the fascinating thing with, with life is. And only. that's all you have to do every time is only add the 100 to 200 grams of larva. Um, but then do you also have to add any of the, uh, but in, only in the first load you have to add the microalgae and some zooplankton? Exactly. So okay. what we do as well, I mean, you could keep this system running indefinitely, basically speaking, right? If you harvest correctly and if you um, keep up the system up and running, then, then you're fine. But... Um, we have many different algae that, that we know of, right? And some have evolved to work best at a temperature of, let's say, 60 degrees, and uh, others work at temperatures of, let's say, 100 degrees. So what, what we are proposing uh, is that during the winter time, you go for strains of algae that are working best under these winter conditions. And if summer rolls around, you switch out these algae um, yeah. that are adapted to these hotter climates. Mm -hmm. And the same thing can be done with the zooplankton, obviously, as well. And uh, to some extent, at least, uh, for the fish or shrimp part as well. Okay. And then now, um, the size right now is pretty large. It's kind of like the size of like this, this, this closet here. Yeah. And where do you, yeah, what do you see? Do you see this getting into like shipping containers and being placed in like local communities and um, feeding people that way? Yeah, so I mean our next step and ambition actually is to scale this up to 40 foot shipping containers in size. Oh, okay, awesome. um, and the modularity of the system allows us to basically scale this up, uh, scale these operations up to football fields in size, feeding cities and uh, even even countries if necessary. So it really becomes a question of, of scale. A football stadium in size? Oh my gosh. Yeah, just that's mind blowing. I mean, if you <laughs> if you watch uh, the ships um, at Golden Gate Park, you know, just rolling through. Oh, not Golden oh, Gate, oh, uh, Lands End Park. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. the big barges with all the shipping containers. A exactly. Yeah, yeah. So they have uh, eighteen thousand shipping containers on on, on them, and that's. Yeah. 
our vision to at one one day load up a ship like this with uh, a farm out of the box with our system and the cool thing is that we can deploy them anywhere right especially in, in regions that are currently not usable for a anything else like deserts yes. and um, I think the interesting thing is that if this works and we the data shows that it actually does um, is that you can take off pressure from either agricultural space but more importantly from uh, rainforests for example that are currently being cleared because we just need to produce the soybeans to, to feed yeah. a growing population. Yeah. Okay, so, so, in, um, so all the way up in size to potentially football stadiums, shipping containers mm -hmm. is the next step and then also to be able to put it into places that are uh, uh, either really dry, that land is not um, suitable for, for harvest, yeah. um, to feed growing populations of people, yeah, all I mean, these types of things. Pic picture LA. LA, geographically wise, is I think one of the worst locations where you can put a city with how many people? I think, I think like th 10, ten plus million. Yeah, exactly, yeah. it's basically a desert. Uh, definitely if you cross the mountains, you're, you're in the Mojave Desert. So basically most of it has to be shipped in from over 100 miles away. Especially when it comes to fish, even despite the fact that it's, that it's on the ocean. Yeah. Um, but you have a lot of land that could that's actually perfect for our system. Mm. You have a lot of land and a lot of sun. And mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is closing, closing quite a big gap. And so many people want to eat protein. People want to eat seafood. You know, yeah, and they want yeah. to eat seafood that has never been exposed to microplastics and pesticides oh. and stuff like this. Oh, this is big. So yeah, that's, I think, I think we are addressing yeah. I don't think a market niche in the beginning. I think, um, you know, going into this. So, I mean, we started this project as engineers, right? And biologists because we like it. Um, but if you go into the field, how animal protein is produced, it's getting quite scary also for, for the fishing, fishing side of things. And I think here we can actually, or we, ha not we can, we have to, uh, look for alternative sources and we hope that we can be such an alternative source. And then how does it work with, I just have to quickly say on the, mm -hmm. on the, um, on the microplastics and pesticides, oh my gosh, that's a big point um, because we have a lot of issues with, our, with our, um, how we're polluting our, our oceans and, um, and so that, that's, that's a big one. Um, and so people, um, as we do that cleanup there, we'd like to eat seafood. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now I, I'm curious on, on um, um, how does the, uh, the f couple questions, how do the fish, um, shrimp in this case, let's say, how do they kind of interplay with each other in such a small like environment with a thousand or two thousand of them? Um, for shrimp, it's actually an issue because they're, they are territori t territorial, um, oh. but it's not the water volume that ma matters, but the surface they cling on. Right, so even in, in a shipping container size, if you introduce uh, surfaces, yes. uh, you can do a lot of stuff there. So, uh, and compared with traditional aquaculture, okay. our densities are way, way lower, right? It's, we don't even compare. Um, for salmon farming, mm -hmm. for example, you see stocking densities of 120 or 100 kilograms of fish per cubic meter of water. Now, um, a fish or a harvesting, or a fish that's ready to harvest, then to put it like this, uh, weighs about five kilograms. So you have picture 20 salmons this big in one cubic meter, it's like the distance between us, right? And you have mm -hmm. 20 salmon there. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> actually quite disgusting. Um, and we have stocking densities that are way, way lower. Okay, this, okay yeah. so it's called stocking densities. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, it's basically and how much yeah. fish you put in into a given volume. Of okay, water. and you have lower stocking densities yeah. and also for shrimp, you're introducing those, like you said, these barriers, yeah. okay, that for them to cling on. Okay, and then, and then one more thing is that you talked about um, uh, AI machine learning um, mm -hmm. earlier, and I just want to um, make sure people know. So you're so you're actually using computer vision to uh, make an identifier on every single fish and monitor it. Th that's the dream. I mean, right now we're tracking behavior of of the swarm itself, right? So we are able to identify 
every, every fish as, as fish or much rather as the species, we're able to track the behavior, we're able to identify whether a fish is, is sick or not. Um, okay. sa same okay. thing with, with Daphnia, right? We can track uh, how active are they, we can um, count their population every, okay. I think it's every 40 seconds or something. Okay. Um, so it's actually a quite dense net of, of data that we're collecting. So it's this sensor suite and this dense net of data that gives yeah. you insights where you can intervene if things are wrong. Exactly. So um, that's, that's the reason why we do it, but not because we don't want to be wrong or uh, catch sickness as it happens, we want to turn it in, into the positive direction, right? So if uh, a population mm -hmm. is doing particularly well, uh -huh. we can see what's going on what's there, going on? right? To replicate it. Exactly, and then if you have like this container farm, right? You just basically take this, make a software update on everything else and start this production level from, from this higher stage. And one thing that I, I wanted to mention as well, because he said it before, I mean, uh, I think for us it's, it's important to work with nature and, and not against it. Mm -hmm. And uh, these ecosystems are already incredibly efficient, these organisms are yeah. incredibly efficient. So if you give them room to, to grow, right, they will do it anyways. Yeah. And yeah. Um, this is why things like stocking densities and for us is really, uh, is really important to yes. keep it you know, within ethical limitations. Yeah, I, what you just said there is massive. To actually be able to work with nature instead of against it yeah. is so, so big. Yeah. Um, and, and we haven't been doing this for the last 30 years, for sure. We haven't, yeah, we, yeah, we haven't been working with nature for so long. Our species has um, amnesia from where we come from, from what our source is, and we, we desperately need to connect back to, yeah. um, to nature, and, and so, yeah. And this is what we are trying to do. It, it is, it looks like a super engineered system, and it is, but the engineering serves the purpose to let natural systems run their course if that makes sense, yeah. right? It's really building something around the, the core processes. And uh, if a core process is undisturbed and runs well, then it makes economic profit as well, right? Yes, it's, um, yes. Yeah, that's so sort of the uh, philosophy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's so cool thinking about, yeah, the future of um, having like blue plant ecosystems ar around the world um, and so the, the more people are able to eat um, uh, more local to them. Mm -hmm. um, there's a super uh, closed loop systems with, um, with microalgae, zooplankton, and, um, and fish being grown, and seafood being grown. And then just the decreased transit amount, um, so the, more, um, the less we're actually uh, stripping the oceans from, from, I mean, these are like critical things, the less microplastics that are in the fish that yeah. we consume. Yeah, all these types of things. And I mean, I just want to clarify that, that we don't want to replace like fisheries and, and aquaculture. I mean, just the fact that we need to double the amount of calories that humanity is producing in the next 20, 30 years uh, is a concern. So any technology that's able to produce food somehow is, is desperately needed. And um, I don't know if you saw this cool film, uh, Our Planet or The Planet. Okay. And then David okay. Attenborough got, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, gave a speech okay. where he said, and I actually checked this out afterwards, but uh, our species and our um, livestock is now 96% of mammal biomass. So all the, the you know, Damn. zebras and, and lions and giraffes yeah. and whatever, that's and elephants, it's like 4% and the rest is basically us. It's like chickens, pigs, cows. Exactly, and then us yeah. humans. And we yeah, need yeah. to double this somehow. So yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, don't really yeah, see, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't yeah, really yeah. see how, how, we can, how we can do this, right? And you've all know Harari talks about it too. It's, a, yeah. it's one of those big ones. Um, yeah. And I, it can, yeah. I mean, it can really go both ways. So either we become like a monoculture desert planet. And I really say it like this, because um, I think you know feeding humans is more important than keeping jungles up, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. 
but uh, I think the second option is more attractive to have like we can uh, do, we a can, garden we, we planet. Have to do, we have to do a garden planet. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. have to do that. Um, we can't feed humans and destroy our ecosystems. That's ridiculous because then there's no ecosystems to live in afterward. Yeah, exactly, yeah, and, yeah. and this this is my concern as well. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I think this the second option just makes a lot more sense. And I think California as an example, right, you have, or the United States, you have, um, I mean, you're being trashed a lot in, in Europe <laughs> for yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> environmental stuff. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I think what you realized as this first nation ever, I think, is the importance of, of national parks and, and especially you. you oh, in yeah. Thank goodness for yeah. the national parks. Yeah. And I mean, especially yes. California, it's like it shows how important, important. this is. Oh, right? we would have destroyed all the areas of national parks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now so it's grateful, like... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So grateful for that foresight. Yeah. And it makes economic sense, right? So I'm an engineer and economist, so I really try to see both yeah. sides, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think sustainability makes economic sense in yeah. also in the short run, I think. I'm so glad that you bring that up because that's, yeah. um, we definitely would have a much larger like dystopia if, if, it, if we wouldn't take care of our na national parks along the way. And we do need to feed more people on the planet mm -hmm. and we, um, we do need to do it in a sustainable way. Blue Planet Ecosystem is definitely doing that. Um, wh and then what's the, uh, the close on the round that you guys are closing? What are you guys looking for? And also um, what um, teammates and stuff do you need to get to the shipping container size? Sure, so um, we are raising 2.8 million right now um, we got the first commitments so mm -hmm. fingers crossed that <laughs> our run is, uh, is done pretty pretty soon um, for us we want to use the funds to actually build the full s scale like full scale stacks of the system and uh, we've got teams in place that are pretty capable of, of doing this it's like traditional Central European German Austrian <laughs> you know, welding okay. and labor and Love stuff it, like yeah, this. Yeah. Um, what we are looking for are actually biologists, okay. uh, data scientists, um, people that work um, between the interface of electronics and, and uh, computer science, basically. Yes, okay. Wow, I look forward to, you know, a future where the kids can look back and say that, you know, why didn't we have these things earlier? Um, and we should have been more connected to nature and taking better care of it. And and I think, you know, Blue Plain Ecosystems is a big one. Uh, this reminds me a lot, actually, of like aero farms and stuff, too. They're in the massive warehouses and, you know. And yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful to see us moving in this direction. Yeah, I, th I think all of these companies are addressing the, the right problem. Uh, yeah. There are obviously issues with all technologies, also like with aero farms, where's the electricity coming from and stuff like this, but yeah, at yeah. least they are addressing, they are absolutely addressing the right problem. And yeah. um, I think many other indie bio companies um, are addressing the right problem. Yes. And just the fact yes. that you have investors that are saying, cell-based meat, you know, yes. seven years of research at least, Yes. Here you have money. It's it's a great thing, and this is actually what makes me quite optimistic. Yes, yes. Huge thank you for coming on the show and teaching awesome. us all. Yeah. Thank you Thanks very for much. Me. Huge thank you. Yeah, you're doing great work. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Also, do check out the links below to Blue Planet Ecosystems. I'll check out the links below to Indie Bio. Have more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media about these sustainable ecosystems and how they can impact the world, teach it to children, spread it around the world. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below so we can continue doing cool things like coming to Indie Bio Demo Day. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you soon. Peace.